People are describing Jeremy Corbyn as unelectable. I have been on a couple of rallies where he has been and I have heard him speak and I have filmed him. So I thought I'd put together just some of what I've seen and then people can decide based on what he said why they think he is unelectable. Straight after we won the leadership election last year, we came to this very same spot to speak up for the rights of refugees to live in our society. And one of the horrible disfigurements of our society is racism, is intolerance, and the violence that's often associated with it and sadly this has increased over the last few days can we all agree we are going to unite together as one people one society and one community to oppose racism and that and recognize that the grotesque exploitation of workers in zero hours, on zero hours contracts in factories around Britain, called out by Dennis Skinner quite brilliantly in the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago, shows that we don't need the blame culture, we need the unite culture yeah. of working together yeah, yeah, yeah. for the social justice to which we all aspire. We have a government that is destroying council housing and public sector housing within our society, that is failing and refusing to regulate the private rented sector, that is allowing children to be brought up in insecure, overcrowded, damp, expensive accommodation. We have a government that is giving tax breaks and tax relief to the super rich within our society. We have a government that is systematically privatising at least half of our National Health Service. Our movement, our Labour movement, was founded on the most immense struggle. Those that laid down their lives in the 18th and 19th century. Those that were gunned down campaigning for the right to vote. Those that were gunned down trying to become trade unionists. Not just here, but all around the world. It's the spirit of hope or the spirit of despair. Which are we? We're obviously hope, not despair. So that hope recognises that those that struggle against racism, those that struggle for rights to be lesbian, to be gay, be whatever you want to be, those who struggle to achieve those things, those who struggled to gain the right for women to vote. All of those things were gained by struggle. And I would want nothing more than our history teaching in schools to so improve that our children understand the rights they have, the rights they enjoy, came from those that laid down their lives before. It's also about the kind of society and kind of world we want to live in. I've mentioned refugees, I've mentioned economic injustice, I've mentioned the services that we have. But we also have to think about our natural world and our environment. Either, either we live in the natural world and ex accept we have to sustain it by defending it, or we grotesquely exploit it. So I want to see a government in Britain that does house people, that does protect and defend our environment, 
that does protect and extend our health service, but also reaches out with attitudes in society. We have, we have a, we have a mental health crisis within our society, and Diane is very well aware of the importance of how we deal with that. So if I may say so, it's also a question of our own attitudes towards those that are going through stress or crisis, how we change that and recognize that we suffer stress through economic injustice, through inequality, through work, through debt, a whole lot of things. But we have to also think of how we behave ourselves. And so I just ask you this very carefully and very specifically. When we disagree with each other, as we sometimes do, when we disagree with other people, as we sometimes do, if we hurl abuse at each other, I hurl abuse at you, you hurl abuse at me, I hurl it back, the first two or three times it's quite funny, or can be, the fourth or fifth time you've totally lost the audience who may have been listening to you in the first place. So, we pursue the politics of justice, of equality, of human rights, of peace around the world, but we also pursue the politics of respect of how we treat each other. And so, that way, we build greater unity. That way, we build a unity of people. I do not want to live in a country where there are people sleeping on the streets while the mansions are kept empty. I do not want us to walk away from any international conventions on human rights and replace them with something else. Because to me, human rights are universal, not national. And so the political atmosphere we have is about challenging those orthodoxies. But it's also about challenging an economic orthodoxy that has been on the rampant march for 30 years or more. I don't want to be somebody that says to young people, sorry, you're not gonna have it as good as we did because the nation can't afford it. And sorry, your children, our grandchildren, are not gonna have it as good as you are because the nation can't afford it and we then cascade inequality and poverty and debt down the generations? Or are we to say that the brilliance of technology, the brilliance of science, the brilliance of engineering can, should, and must be the tool and the opportunity for the redistribution of wealth, for the opportunities of equality? And that we develop an economy that excites people and mobilizes a whole generation that have been told they only have to look forward to a lifetime of debt in the future. That's why the movement we now have in Britain, the movement for social justice and the movement for equality is so strong. Why it reaches out so broadly. Because we learn from each other. Because we learn from the values of each other. Because we learn from the history of each other. Because we learn from the tolerance of each other. For whatever grouping, ethnicity, faith we happen to be. That is where unity comes in. And that is what makes us strong. Don't let the media divide us. Don't let those people who wish us ill divide us. Stay together, strong and united for the kind of world we want to live in. Thank you very much. What we've got here tonight is an amazing mixture of people from every conceivable community in this borough and in this wonderful city. People coming together because they realize the importance of struggling together to achieve things that benefit all of us. The issues around this election, one are uh, the question of the leadership of the Labour Party, but it's actually wider and more fundamental than that. It's about the way in which we do politics within our society. Last year, we contested the leadership of the Labour Party after Ed Miliband had resigned. I was 
very upset, as I'm sure everyone here was, by the general election result last May. But you have to ask yourself a question. When we go into an election campaign with many very good things in the manifesto, you can be pleased at the result. But, and there is a big but there, there was a problem. The problem was that we were not actually challenging the fundamentals of what was going on in Britain, which was the rolling back of the state, the destruction of public services, and the austerity programme being put forward by the government. So it is about opposing the fundamental economic strategy that this government is putting forward. And we're not alone and isolated in doing that. There are many across Europe, across the United States, that all say we've had enough of 40 years of being told that the rolling back of the state, the diminution of the state, the aggrandizement of per personal wealth of amazing proportions amongst a small minority and the growth of poverty um, at the other end of the scale are somehow or other an economic price worth paying. If you are to represent people, if you are to have a mass movement, then we have to owe our allegiance to the people and the mass movement and the support of many people who wanted to see politics done very differently. And I'm very grateful to all those that have stood up to be counted over the past few weeks when much of our media has been united in the view that basically we should shut up and go away because they don't like our voices. And instead, we're offering something very, very different. I tell you this, John McDonnell was appointed Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer straight after the election last year. And I'm very proud of the work that John has done as Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. He and his team, it's not about individuals, it's about teams of people, immediately got to work on a different economic strategy. A strategy that invests, a strategy that provides work for all, and a strategy that analyzes what government does as it benefits or damages different communities. That surely has to be the right way of doing things. So he looked at the environmental impact of what the government is doing. He looked at the effect on women of what the government is doing. He looked at the effect on black and minority ethnic communities on what the government is doing. And he looks at an economic strategy that is fundamentally wrong and has to be changed. Has to be changed in the direction of investment in public services investment in education, investment in growing good technology industries, but it's also about investment in future generations. But access to education, access to health, access to work, access to so many community benefits is not the same. If you live in a wealthy area, you will not have had too many cuts in your local government budget. If you live in a poor area, you would have had massive cuts in your local authority budget. You could draw a map of England, put over it a colour, shall we say red, for the poorest areas of the country. You could put large red swathes all over places in England. Many parts of London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, Bristol, Newcastle, put them there. Then overlay it another map, and you could say, colour this one blue, for example. That would be a very good choice. And you could put there the areas that have received the biggest cuts in public expenditure, the biggest attack on their local authority budget. And you know what? The red would be obliterated by the blue. Wouldn't it be nice if we turned it the other way around and the red obliterated the blue? But you then have to look at the reality of life in Britain today. The amount of money spent by major companies on wages as a proportion of their income is reducing. The amount of gross national product goes on wages is reducing. The amount spent on high, very high executive pay is increasing. The amount spent on dividends is going up, generally speaking. And we have an economy that is imbalanced. 
imbalanced regionally and imbalanced in so many other ways. And then you start to look at why that is. You look at the way trade union membership has been attacked ever since Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in 1979. Then you look at the attacks on the rights at work, workplace rights that are so important, rights to representation that are so important, and a whole big pattern begins to emerge. And so I want to make it absolutely clear that we will not tolerate any form of anti-Semitism, any form of Islamophobia, any form of racism whatsoever within our society. And if there are concerns about what goes on with any of our organisations, local authorities, our political parties or anything else, we have to be prepared to examine it, to expose it, to face up to it and to deal with it. You've created jobs in the building industry, jobs in the supply chain. It becomes an economic generator to invest in bricks and mortar rather than a benefit system that subsidises at one level high rents and at the other level low wages. So you deal with these issues by a higher living, a real living wage of £10 per hour, which is what the TUC figure has been put out. So it is the economic issues, it is the services that we want to deliver. But it's also about the kind of politics and kind of society we want to live in. People in this park have made huge sacrifices over many years to ensure that supplementary schools happen so that children whose first language is not English or the family's first language is not English grow up understanding, yes, the need to learn English, but also the need to retain the understanding and culture and language of where their families come from. It is not a weakness in a society to have bilingual children. It's an incredible plus and strength and we should be proud of it. But it's also how we do our politics. How we do our politics, is it to be that the views of ordinary people, and we're all ordinary, we're all very normal. In fact, we're so normal, each one of us is totally unique. <laughs> unique in our outlook, our ideas, and our views, but it's also about how we want to develop politically as a society. Are we to de allow a number of um, very experienced commentators to decide what competence is, what views are, what ideas are, or what pressure is, or are we to instead say, actually, what's happened over the past year has been too, uh, totally fascinating. 300,000 people, absolutely of their own volition, not necessarily of identical political views, have joined a political party for a purpose, because they want to see a country, a country that values every one of its citizens. This is saying that we approach our politics on the basis that not one person, not one community, not one geographical area of our country should ever be left behind. And, but there's also here an opportunity to democratise our politics, so every one of you here that has brilliant ideas on schools, on housing, on hospitals, on mental health, on cultural expression and values, can be heard, can put those views forward, and can put them forward with confidence that in that strength, in that growing strength, we build a movement that will bring many more people towards us, bring many more people towards the idea we don't have to live in inequality, we don't have to live in injustice, we don't have to lead poor lives. Let's together be strong, together be happy, together be united, but above all, together to be respectful of each other. We win people to us when we speak to them with respect, speak to them with a language they understand. That way, we win our justice, we build our strengths, and we win the... Fr
freedoms for everybody else to enjoy the kind of decent society and standard of living that they all deserve. And we pay great tribute to all those that have made so many sacrifices over the centuries and the decades to bring us to this place. Thank you very much for coming today. Yes, you can. Yes, we can. Ethics back into politics. So my friends, what I'm trying to say is that the appeal of Jeremy Corbyn goes beyond the politics of left and right. Yes, people want economic justice, but they want dignity. They want ethics and honesty in their politics too. And this is why Jeremy can reach communities that no other politician can. Let's get something clear. Jeremy Corbyn is not to blame for Brexit. Corbyn's leadership is exactly what we need to undo that damage. Translating people's concerns about immigration into concerns about austerity. And so, our campaign does unite lots of other campaigns. I'm not apologizing for that, because I think that is what gives us the aggregation of strengths, of views of a very wide range of people on a very wide range of causes. So we've put forward policy ideas in this campaign. We've united an awful lot of people. And I tell you this, this is the, I think, 56th campaign event I've been to in the past month or so, a month and a, month and a half, and we now have more than 30,000 volunteers helping in our campaign. That is a movement I think we should be very proud of. And it shouldn't be seen, it shouldn't be seen by anybody as a threat, it should be seen as something else. Surely the involvement in so many more people in active political life is a very good thing. So after this campaign is over, we will then go out the Tories and say, hang on, we're offering something different. We're offering to unite people around an agenda of opposing austerity. We're offering to stop wasting nine and a half billion pounds a year on subsidizing expensive rents in the private rented sector through, through housing benefit. Instead, we're gonna invest in housewives. And instead of saddling our health service with expensive PFI contracts that uh, cost so much and produce so little for the NHS, we're going to reorganise things so that that money instead goes into patient uh, care and support. And our health service isn't run for the benefit of private companies that could leech off it. Instead, every NHS worker is an NHS worker, not something working for a private company. So all these things are very, very important. But, and I love the, the two songs, well, the many songs in the film, the two I loved the most were Bread and Roses and The Power of the Union. Yeah. Because in all of us, there's a cultural endeavor. This cinema is an example of that. It used to be called The Rex, it's out of Phoenix. It's been a place where there's been uh, interesting films shown, unusual films shown, independent films shown. And I want us to have, and be proud of having, an arts and culture policy in this country that does give space to artists, to writers, and to young people. <laughs> and it would not be great if every school had access to music, access to culture, access to dance, so that every child could learn a musical instrument and learn from that. And then the film, yeah, the song at the end sung by Billy Bragg. Power of the Union was quite, it's quite incredible. It always moves me, that, that song, because it does bring people together, understanding each other's issues and struggles, but understanding when you do things together, you achieve things together. So those very brave people in the lesbian gay community who during the miners' strike went into the coal fields to give support, raised phenomenal sums of money to keep the strike going. They deserve a huge place in history for the bravery they did and the way they taught the rest of the country. Prejudice divides. Prejudice damages. Just as much as hate crime divides and damages. If a community turns in on itself, 
blames the nearest lesbian or gay, blames the nearest migrant worker, blames the nearest refugee, blames the nearest person who doesn't speak English and speaks some other language as being the cause of all their problems. You then create a whole miasma and nastiness of aggression, unpleasantness, and horror for the individual who's the victim of that prejudice. And you know what? At the end of it, you've built not one school, trained one doctor, produced one nurse, <laughs> and then you can cut off anyone. It's only when you bring people together, you appeal things. And our campaign is about uniting all those that want to see politics done in a different way. Policies coming up, not down. Ideas coming up that they may flower and we can all benefit from it. And to me, the media criticisms and attacks on us, obviously I prefer they haven't taken place, but I tell you what, I don't get out of the bed in the morning and rush to the store and buy all the papers and shout at them. <laughs> I instead want to get out there and do the campaigning, bringing people together in unity. And that's just what we've achieved during this campaign. That's what we're going to achieve in the future. And that's why the next generation should be a generation that is better off than this one, and the one after that should be even better off. So challenge the idea of an economic uh, agenda from the neoliberals, that the state can no longer provide health, no longer provide education, no longer provide housing, no longer house the homeless. The state somehow or other has to disappear from that. No, it doesn't. No, it does not. Those actions and communities across the USA are saying the same thing as we're saying here, as many people are all across Europe. This is a political movement to challenge economic orthodoxy, which creates inequality, injustice, poverty, and homelessness. We can, should, and will do things very, very differently. Thank you very much. Together be strong, together be happy, together be united, but above all, together to be respectful of each other.